Hello, welcome to this very special edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at the House of Swing, Jazz and Lincoln Center here in the heart of Columbus Circle here in New York City. Tonight here on the Pace Report, we're going to celebrate the life and the legacy of composer, saxophonist, flautist, and father, the great Billy Harper. Now, Billy Harper hails from Houston, Texas. And in a career spanning some six decades, Mr. Harper has played with some very important jazz associations and bands. And I'm talking about the great Gil Evans. I'm talking about the great Elvin Jones. Also, the great Max Roach and the iconic Lee Morgan. Now, tonight here on The Pace Report, you're going to witness and celebrate the 50th anniversary of his debut album, Capra Black, which he released on Strata East Record. Here on the Pace Report, we're going to celebrate the 50th anniversary of his debut album, Capra Black, which was released on Strata East, the label that was founded by the great Stanley Cowell and Charles Tolliver. But also, you're going to see 50 years of his legacy with his quintet tonight here at Disney's. We had a chance to sit down and break bread and reflect on his deep Houston, Texas roots. We reflect on some of the very important band members who he recorded, toured, and played with, as well as talk about developing style, as well as some of the things that he stresses as an educator to the next generation of jazz musicians. So sit back, relax, and let's celebrate the 50th anniversary of Mr. Billy Harper's album, Capra Black, his 80th birthday celebration, as well as his legacy.
I'm always honored to be in the presence of legends. And I take that word very serious because um, you have been part of a very rich tradition of black American music as a leader, as a composer, educator, and father. Capra Black is 50 years old, <laughs> and you are 80 years old. <laughs> That's right. How do you feel about this so far? I feel good about it, man. I don't, I don't, I don't even worry about age. I, I'm not even, people have to remind me that I'm 80. I, <laughs> I don't know about <laughs> it, <laughs> you know. I just look at you, I mean, I saw you a couple of weeks ago in Harlem, Cookers. I mean, it's like you and Billy and Dr. Henderson, you guys are just playing like you, or like you in your 20s and 30s. Is this what the music's doing to you? The music does that. You know, it's, I'm, I'm, well, let me think about it. I think it's that when you think about the music and how it's supposed to be, it affects you. So it makes you feel like like that fresh kind of music stuff happening. It's in you. Capra Black, Strata East Records. Tell me about you leading your own group at this point. This is the very first time the world gets to hear compositions from you. And the band that you have the cast band of castmates is just ridiculous also. Tell me about this project. Well, you know, uh, it was, uh, I'm, I'm glad that uh, it was Tolliver and Stan, Charles Tolliver and Stanley Cowell started the uh, Strata East. Uh, and that was an opportunity, finally, for the musicians to own their own product. And that was, everybody loved that, you know, because, yeah, before that, it was always, some big name company, and they own you, they own your records. So some, uh, I don't know, you can see it sort of like, some of the guys thought of it as sort of like a slavery kind of thing, you know, which is, seems like it. the owner owns you and owns your stuff. <laughs> but uh, no, when we, when uh, they started uh, Strata East, it was like you were free. Play what you want to play, you choose. Uh, choose what you want to play, you choose the musicians, and the company doesn't tell you what to do, you know. You know, Bill, I, I wanna, I'm going to go over just the band. Um, I've interviewed Jimmy Owens here on The Pace Report. You've got Dick Griffin, Julia Priester on trombone, Mr. Cables, George Cables on piano, and Reggie Workman, who, again, I think now the world is now starting to appreciate him now, mm. as they should, because this man has been on some very important records. Of course. And he's accompanied some very important heavyweights like yourself. And then you, on the drums, which, which is wild, you had Billy Cobham, Elvin Jones, mm -hmm. and Warren Smith. What were you thinking about when you were putting this ensemble or ensembles together? Well, you know, I, I was mainly thinking about rhythm, so I first thought about Elvin, Elvin Jones. Uh, let's see, he wasn't able to do the whole uh, record. He had to do something, go out of town or something. But uh, the, the feeling of Capra Black, the song Capra Black was Elvin. You know, it's like when I, whenever, I was, whenever I started writing that song, I was thinking about Elvin, and that's the way it felt. So it had to be Elvin, you know. And uh, I was able to get uh, get him to play on that. It's great. And he's one of your heroes, but one of your mentors because you played with him for for, for oh, yeah. a minute. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, in here in in New York, you know, I played with him a little bit. Uh, but uh, he he was able to uh, to get to the recording of Capra Black before I even played with him in his group, you know. But we finally had a chance to do that, and that's good. Are you happy with the record 50 years? Because <laughs> I say I ask you that because there are records that age well and there are records that don't age well. <laughs> and this record, I hear it now and I'm like, Whew. it's just, even when you get past the second song, you're like, 
okay, I think I need to get me a little. I need to get. I need to get. How how are you feeling now that the record's fifty years old? Do you think it's held its weight? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think uh, in one way it's uh, held its weight because the kind of uh, rhythm that we were doing was a little more advanced than the usual, you know. So that was going to make it last for years, and it, it has lasted. But I, and I love the way Elvin played anyway, you know. I, in, in, in college, I used to practice so much and hard and hard, and when I got tired, I'd go jump on the drums and try to play. I, but I'd be trying to play like Elvin. <laughs> <laughs>
to talk about some very, very important roots to you. You, you are from Houston, and Texas has had a history of important saxophone players. Illinois Jaquette. Mm. Um, or Nick. On a, yeah, yeah, on that Coleman. I mean, and on that Cobb. Yeah, yeah, on that yeah. Cobb. Right, right. What is it about the Texas saxophonist that it's almost like I have to compare New Orleans with the trumpet players and the drummers? There's a yeah. there's a connection with the the saxophonist with Houston or, or with Texas. Yeah, you know, I good thought. I'm thinking now that. It pro I bet it has to do with uh, <laughs> coming up in the black church. You hear the ministers, I, you know, they don't, they don't just talk the way most uh, uh, ministers talk. They preach and, and all that. And that's the way the, the horn players. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, he, Houston, your uncle was classmates with Kenny Dorn. And your uncle Earl was the guy that was responsible for you l listening and understanding the music. Right. What was some, who were some of the guys that you were listening to that you were some of your heroes? Well, you know, mainly Kenny Dorn. <laughs> Although I, I, I uh, at the time, uh, uh, I thought I should be listening to saxophonists, but I didn't have to. I could listen to Kenny also and learn learn a lot of stuff and get the right feeling. But uh, you know, in the area of Houston, you had uh, like uh, Arnett Cobb and uh, Johnny Fontanet and uh, 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 Don Wilkerson. Those a lot of people might not have heard of them, but Don Wilkerson was like a a whirlwind. <laughs> he was he was. Uh, Texas Twister. Right. Texas. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. Don Wilkinson was in Ray Charles's band. In fact, Don Wilkinson was on a lot of the the important Ray Charles rhythm and blues songs. Oh yeah, for sure. But I mean, he was playing rhythm and blues style with that band, but when he was at a jam session, it was tearing it up, you know. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What was it about his style? that made you have to kind of regroup and actually just take you, your, your shedding a little bit differently? Uh, it seemed to me that, uh, I don't know, he was able to tongue really fast. And I, I, it, it, I didn't want to play like that, but it seemed like something to be able to do. It was hard to do that. I don't know how he, oh, somebody said he had a short tongue. <laughs> mm, <laughs> yeah, wow. and it, that might make a difference, you know, because, I mean, you know, the the if he can barely touch the reed, he might be able to tongue a little faster. Wow. But I, so I think that that might have been it. Yeah, secret. <laughs> right, well, if if you were fifteen and sixteen and seventeen listening to the masters. What what was your take on guys like Sonny Rollins and guys like? Charlie Parker. These were the, the really the heavyweights of the of black American music at that yeah, time. Yeah. What were your take on those guys? You know, when I first heard Charlie Parker, I said, ah, he plays too fast. <laughs> but I was, <laughs> I was just a youngster, you know, and I didn't understand what bebop was, what it was and how it was happening. But then uh, pretty soon I got into uh, understanding more about Improv, improvising, and uh, listening more for Dexter Gordon, and and then then pretty soon, son, uh, Charlie Mingus made sense. I mean Charlie Parker, and I heard Charlie Mingus too on bass. Uh, but at first, well, like as a kid, I didn't know. I mean, I was uh, I was singing, so I heard singing melodies, you know, kind of. But you always wanted to sing anyway. When I was little. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I did. I was, uh, they always put me on, go on, Billy, get up there, get up. Pushing me up, I was a little kid, get up there and sing. And I sang on church things, you know, solos, and I was gonna be a little soloist. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. You get to college, and um, 
A saxophonist by the name of James Clay enters your realm. Um, James also kind of taught you a little bit of technique or enhancing your technique to say to, 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 to bring it lightly. What else did James add on to your musicianship and what are some things that you did when you were studying and playing with him that you brought to New York City? But you know, I think I think just being around a musician like that kind of helped me to learn something about the the feeling of uh, jazz living, jazz life, jazz production. Clay was uh, James Clay was uh, 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 just very eloquent in in his style of, and way of playing. Which, were, which I thought was very different for Texas because a lot of the Texas tenors, some guys, I can't remember their name, they were, uh, uh, you know, woofing and falling all on the floor, <laughs> falling on the floor and, and bringing the house down. I'm glad I didn't, I'm, I, I was thinking that, wait a minute, maybe that's what I have to do. No, 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 no. I heard Clay. <laughs> now, I, I want to I piggyback on what you just said. Now, that we're laughing at that, but you have to realize guys like Earl Bostic, guys like um, Louis Jordan, oh yeah, guys of the R and B ilk. Those were the things that they were doing, of course, in blues and that was another element of the other side of jazz. Oh uh, yeah, but I, I, <laughs> I, I don't think I ever did it, but I was thinking, I have to get get up and walk the bar, you know. They get up and play and walk on the bar and play. I thought maybe I had to do do that. <laughs> but that was all part of showmanship. That was all part of the show experience. Yeah, yeah, it was all part of the music too. You know, who who were some of the first rhythm and blues and jazz artists that you saw perform in Houston? Well, let's see. I would think. Well, you know, a lot of guys, a lot of the blues guys came through Houston, so. Uh, there were a lot of good guys whose, whose name I didn't remember and know because I was so little. I was well, I was young. Uh, maybe I was eleven. I couldn't remember their names, but they played well. And and everybody, and you had some who lived there and stayed in Houston who also played well. Uh, and like I said, maybe they didn't get a chance to record on a jazz album or something, but they they could play. You know, I, I a lot of them. And and it's just it was like. A lot of saxophonists. I don't know why. There were trumpeters too, but more saxophonists. I don't know.
Freddie, we had a little conversation earlier about <laughs> the band leader and the representation of not only you playing your music, but also paying and keeping the legacy of the elders. And Billy has done a fantastic job of keeping this quintet going for 50 years, and you're part of that legacy. Yes. Tell me how you're bringing your fire to his legacy. Um, you know, when I first started playing with him, I kind of had an out-of-body experience while I was playing the music for the first time because Billy's music is very spiritual and it brings out the best in everybody that encompasses his, his music. You know, it's, uh, I, can't, I can't describe it any other way other than the fact that it's, it's very spiritual, very deep-rooted, deep-rooted in, in the church and the blues and, and all of the elements of jazz but um but it's coming from another place a special place a place of billy harper's own and uh, i'm just honored so honored to be a part of that freddie what was the very first record that you remember billy playing on um Somebody had hit me to a Lee Morgan record called The Last Sessions. And on that record is one of Billy's tunes entitled Croquet Ballet. And if you hear Billy solo over that tune on that particular recording, Billy will forever be with you because everything that he plays is just pure science and, and, and uh, it's just, he's just all a person of his own. He has his own identity, his own sound, you know. And, uh, and that's what every jazz musician should strive for, is to have an identity, their own identity. What does Billy Hopper mean to jazz music? He, he means love and happiness to me, man. You know, his music can compass all of that. You can hear the joy, you can feel the pain, you can, it's the dark with the light, but it's, but it's all well and good. I want to uh, read a quote of something that you said. And it's, uh, it, and, I, and it hit me hard when you said this. It said, you said, many of young guys don't know the history of getting a sound and their purpose. Hmm. Explain that and how do you get your purpose and sound? Well, you know, uh, I'm not sure, I don't think it's just the Texas thing, but in Texas and coming up, everybody was, the guys were talking about a sound, you gotta have a sound. I didn't get that kind of uh, uh, feeling in other places. They, they weren't talking like that, the way they were in Houston. They were talking about having a sound. You gotta have a sound and, and you know, they, their examples were, were Arnett Cobb and, and all those guys. I liked Dickie Lilly, Richard Lilly, mm. you know, and a lot of people didn't get a chance to hear him. But uh, that sound, well, it became very important to have a sound. And by the time I got to college, you know, um, I had a pretty good sound and was developing even stronger sound. So. That was important there in Texas. They were they were not talking so much about technique as much as sound, you know. Now, as an educator, you taught at Manhattan School of Music in Rutgers, right? Yeah, Rutgers. What were some of the things that you instilled upon your students as musicians, soloists, as well as the writing side? Because we're gonna get into composition in just a second. Okay. Let's see. Well, because sound was so, so important to me and in, in, in my learning, I was trying to make sure that they understood something about producing a good sound. That's first. And then, you know, you have some of those players who had a good sound, but not very good technique, <laughs> but they had a sound, you know. And, and uh, if, they, if they could do that, 
they could play a simple melody and uh, uh, play the melodies that people heard and, and it would be appreciated, you know. I, I watched you over the years with the cookers and a lot of your songs are in <laughs> in that cookers set. Mm. And I just, all the musicians and all the mus all my fans that love you, they always talk about two things. They always talk about you, how fire you, fiery you are on the stage, but they always talk about Billy Harper's songbook. Writing and different are two different techniques and practices. Do you spend a lot of time writing? How does the conception of your compositions come to you? Yeah, I don't spend a lot of time writing. I, I, it just a lot of the favorite things that I've written just come. They just come to me. I mean, sometimes I wake up and, and, and I, I was dreaming about this song and I wrote it down and that's one way. Uh, um, I remember uh, uh, one song I was, I was dreaming walking down the street in New York and, and this song was playing in my head and, and I woke up right away and wrote, wrote that, the main part of it down so I could finish it, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, the, 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 this intro came later, but the, the song was from, I was singing, and, and I said, now, now, now that I have found you, girl, ba -do -de -da, da -da. I had some words to a, a popular kind of song, <laughs> a popular kind of song. And then I thought, well, this could be a real, I could make it a real jazz version. Uh, do, you, do you know about the uh, commercial version that I, I did? Okay. Well, anyway, yeah, I decided to make it a, a more of a jazz version. But I heard it first as a popular kind of song, popular tune. Boom. Oh, now that I found you, girl, oh, oh, I know I've won my arms around you. Does that sound, does that sound like Chris's? No. <laughs> <laughs> but but the changes are uh, priestess. And when when I got to the jazz version of it, then I thought we could just float and say, boom. So you see how it relates to that other song, the commercial version? Yeah. I'm not going to do the commercial version anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, good question. Everybody loves you for a myriad of bands that you have played with over the last 50 years. I was talking to Freddie Hendrix just a few minutes ago before we started sitting down. He was talking about how, as a band leader, he's representing not only the music, but the elders that he played with. And every musician that I'm going to ask you about has a very different discipline and a different style. I want to know what you brought to each of these musicians. And the first one is Max Roach. <laughs> Max. Well, you know, Max Roach was a very high standard uh, uh, and, and accomplished musician. So I was able to, a lot of the fellows were, were afraid to even try to play with Max, uh, even sitting in, you know. I was able to, well, I had gone to college and really went through a lot of stuff, a lot of technical stuff. So I knew that I could, I could deal with him on that level. Uh, but he, he was kind of frightening, you know, I mean, he, <laughs> he, he played those fast tempos and stuff. Uh, but it complements <laughs> your, your, your playing style, though. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. why everybody's like, oh, <laughs> man, the three people, they all, everybody remembers Billy Harper for it. it's Max Roach, Elvin Jones, <laughs> I mean, and it's Blakey. It, and Blakey, right? Yeah, yeah. What about Art Blakey? Now he's another beast within <laughs> itself. Yeah, Art Blakey. 
Blakey was like, uh, uh, you know, very fatherly and, and, uh, and he, he knew the world, you know, he was a worldly guy. He, he'd say, uh, uh, and he also played some of those fast tempos like Max too, but, but, uh, but he had uh, uh, grits and stuff, you know, the, uh, like being at a honky tonk. Grits and you know, and I and I was in I, I had a lot of gigs in Houston before I got to New York playing honky tonk stuff, <laughs> you know. Who who was <coughs> who was in <coughs> the Messengers at the time that you were playing with with Art Blakey? Uh, Bill Hardman for one thing okay. on trumpet. Uh, Ronnie Matthews. Ronnie Matthews. And. Uh, uh, Lawrence Evans, who came, I don't, I don't think we came to New York together, but he was from Houston also. Good. Yeah. yeah. And I got him a gig with that, with Blakey, yeah. We have to talk about Thad Jones and Mel Lewis, because the compositions, the band, every time I listen to the, their, their records, their, their stuff was just driving. Yeah. Their stuff was swinging. Yeah. yeah. How how was it like recording and playing with them? Oh, it was great. Uh, you know, I think Thad's background was so strong. I mean, he just he he knew the whole history, <laughs> and it was in him. So he could make. I'm I'm not leaving Mel out, but he was the one who was making it making the real stuff happen. Mel could play, mm -hmm. so so he all he had to do was just be able to play the stuff. Uh, but that had history in him, and he knew the stuff. He knew, he knew how it was supposed to be, uh, and that's what gave the band its uh, definition, identity, let's say. It was a Thad Jones, Mel Lewis Orchestra, yeah. What were the, the, the comparisons and contrast between those brothers? Because they, they, both of them have left a very important legacy in jazz music. You know, I never, I never, Elvin was sitting with the big band every once in a while, but I never heard Elvin and Thad play together in a small group too much. But they, they, they learned the same stuff and came up the same way. Hank Jones yeah, also. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so they all had it. And they played separately when they got professional, you know, New York. Wow, wow. Now, on the composition side, the composing side, who are some of the people that you looked up to or who were some of your influences? Well, uh, uh, of course, uh, I was listening a lot to Blakey, so uh, a lot of the writers with Blakey, I, I was listening to uh, mostly probably and getting the idea of the 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 gumbo the, the 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 little elements that go into this this food that we're gonna play fix and mix make <laughs> so you know I listened a lot to uh, to most of the guys who were playing with with uh, with Blakey uh, before but also uh, there was uh, Max and his 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 uh, surroundings those guys it seemed like when I was trying to get into Max Roach and so forth and his music, they, well, Max in any way was concentrating on uh, kind of difficult stuff, more difficult, you know. And, uh, well, he played with Charlie Parker, so that's what, what was in his head too, you mm -hmm. know. So we were playing, <laughs> by the time I got with Max, you know, we played all these fast tunes because that's the way Max heard it, like Charlie Parker. Right. Yeah. Another guy who um, I miss immensely. In fact, I, I interviewed him a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you were in the band with him, TK Blue, uh -huh. the great Randy Weston. Oh yeah, yes. Randy had uh, uh, just a special, special touch and a special approach to the music, you know. He, he, uh, he almost sometimes sounded like he was, a, he was a singer, but I never heard him sing. <laughs> but but the way he wrote sounded like yeah he might he might he, maybe he did sing. <laughs> <laughs> Randy was such a towering force 
on those. He brought another vision to how he played the piano. What were some things about Randy that you miss as as a saxophonist and as a friend? Oh wow, as a friend, it's a whole lot to miss because he was like, like, you know, father. <laughs> you know, <laughs> oh man, and he was so nice. I was surprised when I met him. I thought, well, okay, I'm gonna go up and meet Mr. Western, you know. And he was just so nice, man. Uh, down home, you know, just perfect. That was a perfect person for me to meet really? in New York, yes. As a leader of your own groups, Billy, um, and at 80 years old, are there some things that you're still learning about black American music? And are there some things or some concepts, music concepts, that you're still bringing to, to your, your music? There's still uh, concepts uh, because there's so much to be explored in, in this uh, creative black music, you know. Uh, different, different areas and different directions in jazz were created by this creative black music. Uh, when I was coming up, I heard, I heard, I heard more of, uh, you know, like uh, uh, Dave Brubeck and that kind of thing. But they got it from the brothers also, right? You know, so you know, I didn't. They were they were the pre uh, predominant groups to listen to or whatever. But they had to get it from the roots also. And that, and that uh, when I dis when I realized that where it really comes from, and and uh, and of course they contributed, but uh, the the real idea comes from that black uh, 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 the black idea of what what improvisation is supposed to be, what music is supposed to be, how you can go further than just you know the usual lines that you've heard. I've always said that um, Lee Morgan was 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 good, and he is a great musician. And you were in that last group, and there are some things about that music, the last two or three years, those Blue Note recordings that was going to take him into another direction. Do you want to expound upon that? Yeah. Uh, well, Lee, in the first place, was a really creative uh, 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 guy and sort of like a real bebopper, <laughs> you know. His sister had something to do with that, too. I, mean, I don't know, I don't, Ernestine, I think. I don't know if she played, but, you know, she had a lot to do with pushing him to do this music. And, and oh, he, well, 
he was around Dizzy and those guys anyway. So yeah, he was gonna play some bebop. Uh, and, and he had it, he had it at a young age. Uh, a lot of people have heard him and they heard him when he was older, but he was, he was a, a young, you know, a young uh, advanced musician at a young age. So he had, the, he had the stuff in his head and he knew what it was supposed to be. He knew how to do it, he knew what to do. And uh, yeah, it was gr great to play with him. I mean, that last group, I mean, Harold Mayburn, <laughs> Jimmy yeah. Merritt, oh, um, <sighs> Freddie Waits. Sometimes, sometimes Freddie. Freddie, 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 yeah. Freddie, Freddie, Freddie uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's interesting now we look back at 50 years of Capra Black and 50 years of your quintet. Does the music get easier? Or do you want it to get harder for your band members to to? Because I notice when I see you you play, it's like, oh, there he goes, he's flying. Um, everyone loves you. I, like I said, I, I'm a big fan, been a big fan of yours for for many, 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 many decades. Does it get easier? Or does it get harder? No, it seems like it's easier. What it's easier for me because it seems like all I'm doing is opening up more. Just open up more, you know, relax, open up more, and it's there. But it's there because I guess when I was little, I was, I got the roots of it anyway in, in the black church. I, the, the real understanding was there, and at a young age, and, and as I grew up, then I realized, okay, this is a little bit more complicated, but it's based on the same roots. So, yeah. How... Does the blues and jazz, how are they related and how are they not related? Because we all say that blues is the birth of jazz and gospel and hip hop, but a lot of people don't really put an emphasis on the blues part of jazz. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think the, the, the difference and the reason is because they, they, they don't understand how the blues is a part of jazz if it doesn't sound like the guy singing, oh, no, 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 yo, baby, oh. You know, that's the blues feeling. But based on that, you got jazz that is a part of that. Right. And it, it's hard to hear it if, if it doesn't sound like that man singing like that. Because <laughs> you know? I ask you that because if you listen to Duke Ellington, you listen to... A lot of the, the, the big bands, Jimmy Lunsford, Count Basie, they all were steeped in the blues. Oh, they knew, they knew, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they knew where it came from, yeah.
All right, let's start in slow action. Billy Harper, what does black American music mean to you? Uh, let's see. Black American music means to me a chance and an opportunity for uh, 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 creativity and for, for the Afro-American musicians to express themselves from their source. And, and their source, a lot of times, will be God, <laughs> you know? Spirituality, that's where it comes, yeah, yeah. That's, that's heavy. That's and so, heavy. I mean, that comes, without my saying, in church, I learned so and so and so, still, <laughs> you know? I want to talk about, last question, I want to talk about this CD. Um, I had the honor of interviewing here on the Pace Report, Mary Baraki. God rest his soul. This is a project he's on, and um, how did this come about? Let's see, I think, uh, well, you know, Amiri had a, a, um, a jazz rhythm in his, so he was like, to me, like another jazz musician, but without playing the, the, the melody notes. But he had the, 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 the rhythm and the attitude. <laughs> well, he probably came up some, somewhat like the jazz musicians, you know. But he just used words. And he had the rhythm, you know, the, the words. He, the way he used the words was like the way somebody would play. And how did you get him to, were these songs, or the, were these poems that he had already written, or is this something that you guys collaborated together on? We did both. Uh, he had written some things, and also we collaborated on some things. And he uh, could, e well, he was, he was hearing like a musician, so he could easily adjust his, his words to the rhythm of uh, the music that we were going to play, you know? He's, he was a musician, yeah. <laughs> That'll do it again for this very special edition of the Pace Report reporting live here at Jazz and Lincoln Center here in the heart of Columbus Circle here in New York City. I'd like to personally congratulate the incomparable Billy Harper. Congratulations on the 50th anniversary of his debut album, Kappa Black, as well as his quintet, also celebrating his 80th birthday. For more information on his upcoming tour dates, please visit him online at billyharper.com and follow him on social media by way of Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Also, i like to personally thank the staff and management here at Dizzy's as well as Jazz at Lincoln Center for their warm hospitality. Desmond and Roland, you guys are doing a fantastic job and your staff is fantastic. You guys helped me out. Thank you. As always, people, I can't stress this enough. Please like, share, and subscribe to my videos here on YouTube and Vimeo as well as follow me on social media by way of Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Until next time, remember if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Until next time, peace.